Good morning, this is Wendy Nelson, talking to you from the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research here at the National Institute of Health. Um, I'm very excited to introduce this morning Dr. Kevin Volk, um, who's going to talk to us about behavioral economics and health, especially how it, how it works with adherence. Um, I think this is a really, really interesting topic, and I think you're going to absolutely love this lecture. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Volpe. I know you don't want to hear me, but um, I will tell you just a little bit about him. He is a physician at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. He's also a professor at the Wharton School of uh, Business and the Penn's, Penn's uh, School of Medicine. And he's also, there is only two uh, National Institute of Health Royal Centers for Behavioral Economics, and he leads one of them. So he, he's doing amazing work in this area, and with that I'd like to introduce him. So here's Dr. Kevin Volpe. Well, thank you, Wendy, and thank you for having me today. What I'm going to try to do is give you a quick snapshot view of, of some of the insights from behavioral economics in thinking about um, how to use these insights to improve health and health behavior. Sorry, one moment, we're just getting the slides working. Okay, so I want to thank a number of funders, both public and private sector, and also acknowledge the contributions of a number of co-authors. So here's the problem we're trying to solve. This is some data that was published a while ago looking at what happens in terms of medication adherence in the context of preventing heart attacks. And it's really quite striking to see that by two years, most people who are put on a statin for primary prevention of heart attacks no longer are taking it. Typically from a clinical standpoint, these are intended to be used lifelong and even in the context of people who have had recent hospitalizations for acute coronary syndromes, you can see that about half of them aren't taking their medicines by two years. This of course is very much related to other work people have done that suggests that behavioral patterns are responsible for about 40% of premature mortality in the U.S. This is a, a, a big deal because many of the other reasons for premature mortality in the U.S. aren't easily addressable, so this both represents a big challenge and a big opportunity. As many of you may know, the U.S. also spends more than any other country on, on health care services, and this disconnect between how much we spend and how well our population does is of increasing concern to employers. Employers for the last several years running in the National Business Group and Health Towers annual survey have reported that employees' poor health habits are the top challenge to maintaining affordable benefits. As a result, a lot of employers have moved towards providing incentives to drive healthier behaviors among their employees. In 2013, the percent of large employers who are using incentives is around 80 to 85 percent. And one of the key issues to recognize here is that we've been on a steady pathway of progress in terms of understanding the science of motivation. We started out with a lot of approaches around information provision. The general consensus has been that those are necessary but not sufficient. What that means is that the data generally shows that those approaches in and of themselves aren't all that successful at changing difficult to change health behaviors. As I mentioned, employers are now providing health incentives to a pretty wide degree. The limitation to a lot of the incentive programs that are being used is that they rest on standard economics, which in essence assumes that people are perfectly rational and that they're able to calculate the costs and benefits of their all the different alternative choices they face now in the future in a dispassionate way uh, with pretty, pretty high reliability. And what behavioral economics has really mapped out is that there are all sorts of ways in which people are predictably irrational. Their decisions tend to be affected by all sorts of factors that deviate from standard economics. A lot of times people are very much affected by how they feel as opposed to any deliberative cognitive process. Framing effects are very powerful. How people feel about the costs and benefits of a decision right now as opposed to in the future is a very big factor. That's obviously a big contributor to health behavior. 
And then we also know that people's decisions are heavily influenced by the decisions of those around them. And all of this has very clear implications for the design of, of health interventions. It's not just the size of the reward that matters, the incentive delivery and design and the choice environment are all really quite critical. One of the limitations to thinking about this simply from a traditional economic standpoint is that to some degree it assumes self-harmful behaviors like smoking or obesity away because it basically presumes that these are optimal based on information and preferences which would imply that just providing information and adjusting prices are all you need to do. And what behavioral economics really suggests is a, a somewhat more forgiving view of the world that recognizes that the decision environment and the structure of incentives has a really big impact on what people actually do. So what I'll talk about is three different areas. One is the power of defaults and choice architecture to drive consumer engagement. Secondly, I'll talk a bit about behavioral economics and incentive design. And then lastly, we'll talk about work that our group and other groups are doing in terms of a concept we call automated hovering. And the basic idea here is tying together advances in wireless technologies in ways that can both increase the success of provider payment reform initiatives and consumer engagement. So first, in terms of defaults, there are some seminal work that was done by Johnson and Goldstein and published in Science in 2003, which really showed in a very striking way the power of defaults. The countries on the left here in yellow are countries that had an opt-in for organ donation. The countries on the right in blue are countries that all had an opt-out for organ donation. And you can see that the degree to which people were uh, being willing to donate their organs is strikingly different. You know, 10 to 20 percent on the countries on the left, close to 100 percent on the countries on the right. There are very few interventions that can achieve the, these kinds of effects. Now one of the questions that gets asked is how do we apply this in practice and are there settings where this would work, other settings where it wouldn't work. We've been doing some work recently that my colleague Scott Halpern has been leading where we've been looking at this in the context of advanced directives for end-of-life care. This was a study that we did among patients with terminal prognoses such as metastatic lung cancer where we randomized the patients to three different types of advanced directives. One in which there was a comfort care plan of default, one in which there was a standard advanced directive with no default, and the third which was a life extension default. The percent of patients who chose a comfort-oriented goal of care varied considerably with 77 percent of those in the comfort default choosing a comfort-oriented goal of care 61% in the standard advanced directive with no default, and 43% in the life extension default. I think it's important to note here that our Human Subjects Institutional Review Board had us separately debrief with patients after this initial interaction to explain how defaults work and ask them if any of them want, wanted to switch. We found only 2% of patients wanted to switch. Furthermore, when we asked them a series of questions about their preferences in terms of different interventions that could happen, such as feeding tubes, getting cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or mechanical ventilation, those preferences followed very directly from what they had chosen in terms of the default, so it really indicated they understood what these choices meant. And I think this is a very important example in terms of thinking about the reality that every day clinicians around the country by how they frame these decisions are having a very very big impact on what patients actually do and I think one of the big challenges in front of us is to think about how do we think about the use of defaults in terms of clinical health system deliveries in settings and also in terms of insurance settings how do we carefully proceed down this road so we can help patients achieve a better match with what they want by not, uh, the, the, in essence, there's a, there's a big mismatch now many people feel in terms of end of life care because in essence the default is either no discussion of advanced directives 
or full life extension care, even though many patients would actually choose something different if that decision was put in front of them in a different way. So there's also settings in which defaults may not work so well. This was some work we had done with CVS Caremark where they had a program of automatic refills for chronic medications. It's difficult for people who are on a lot of medications to remember when all the refills are due. And what they had done was they had set up this program whereby each prescription, once it was expiring, would automatically get sent to you if you chose to be in this program. This was originally set up as an opt-in program. Not surprisingly, participation rates were low. And they asked us if we could help them increase participation rates. The first question we asked was, could you set this up as an opt-out program? They said, no, we can't do that because every time one of these prescriptions gets sent out, we have to charge people's credit cards. And if people haven't explicitly authorized that, they won't be very happy with us. So we built on some work that had been done using a concept called act active choice in the retirement savings realm and embedded this within the prescription refill process. So you could, every time you fill one of your prescriptions, this choice was put in front of you of signing up for the automatic refill program. And what we did to try to enhance this a little bit was we added some language highlighting some of the advantages in terms of convenience. So on this slide on the bottom left, it says press one if you would prefer to refill your prescriptions by yourself each time, or press two if you would prefer for us to do it for you automatically. And you can think of this as a fairly gentle nudge. The language here obviously could be much stronger, but we were just trying to highlight to people some of the advantages in terms of convenience. And just doing this and embedding this in the refill process led to more than a 100% increase in the proportion of people who chose this program. So I'm going to talk a bit about behavioral economics and incentive design. You can think about the typical insurance plan as being like a giant incentive program. There's lots of different levers here that are being pulled where economic incentives are being used to try to drive lower or higher utilization of different kinds of services. But many plans look like this where there's a lot of small print and many, many pages like this of information. The challenge is that there's a lot of standard economics that goes into the typical plan design and some people would argue there's just too much here. So there's a veritable alphabet soup of different levers that are being pulled to try to incent utilization or uh, disincent utilization, co-payments, deductibles, co-insurance, maximum out-of-pocket limits, dollar limits, visit limits, allowances, FSAs, HRAs, HSAs, and personal benefit allowances. And in the work we and others have done, I, I think it's pretty clear that the average person doesn't really understand what they're being incented to do in the typical plan. The typical plan design is way too complicated, which makes the efforts to use standard economic incentives and price adjustments less effective. In recognition of this, one of the major insurers worked with us in the past year to design a new plan which basically distilled a lot of these elements uh, down to just having copayments. We had found in some work we had done that copayments were much better understood by people than, for example, deductibles. There's some intuition behind that because copayments reflect the type of prices people are used to paying when they buy other goods and services. Deductibles, it's much harder to compute how much you actually have to play. Uh, sorry, how much you actually have to pay. So Humana released this plan in the last year. It's called Humana Simplicity, and we're very interested to see how that, how that works. One of the limitations to having a complicated plan is that standard economic approaches may not accomplish the goals that you hope they'll accomplish. This was a landmark study that Natish Chowdhury at Harvard did with Aetna where they randomized patients who had had hospital, hospitalizations for heart attacks to either standard copayments or zero dollar copayments making the cardiovascular medicines free. 
And there are different ways of looking at these data, but I think there's two very striking findings here. One is that the control group only had filled prescriptions for their cardiovascular medicines on 39% of the days following in the year following a heart attack. So that means in that year, they only had filled prescriptions about 120 of 365 days. That's pretty abysmal, and it indicates that we're not doing that much better than the data I showed you at the outset of the presentation that showed that more than half of people aren't taking their medicine within two years. The other striking fact here is that making the medicines free helped, but it didn't help very much. So the zero dollar copay group had an average adherence of 45%. This was a statistically significant increase, but I think we can all see that this did not solve the problem of medication non-adherence. There's another provision in the uh, Affordable Care Act, which is actually quite important in the realm of economic incentives. Section 2705 is going to allow employers, effective January 1, 2014, to provide rewards or penalties for outcome-based incentives of up to 30% of total premiums. This is obviously potentially going to be a big game changer because it involves a lot of money. And the key question here is going to be how is this going to be implemented and is it going to be done using standard economics, just doing premium adjustment, or will, it be, will there be behavioral elements built in? And I think there are a number of reasons to think that doing this using standard economics won't achieve the kind of effects people are hoping to achieve in terms of improving behavior. I just showed you one example of that with the free medicines for cardiovascular care in the year following a heart attack. But here's another example from a totally different realm, uh, which I think is also very illustrative. So the problem here that was being addressed by some economists at MIT was that low and moderate income families don't participate in tax protected savings plans at very high rates. And they looked at two different ways of trying to approach this. One was the so-called savers credit, which was a federal income tax reduction of up to 50% of the funds contributed to people's individual retirement accounts. This was equivalent to a 100% match for the lowest income group. The second solution was the so-called savings match program. And what they did in this case was they ran an experiment at 60 H&R block offices in St. Louis where people were randomly assigned to one of three match rates for IRA contributions, either 0%, 20%, or 50%. Standard economics would clearly suggest that the savers credit should have been far more effective in terms of both uptake rates and the amount people contributed, but what they found was the opposite. The match experiment was actually far more effective at both the 20% match and the 50% match level in terms of take-up rates and contributions. So the reasons for this are all behavioral. The savers credit had a benefit that was integrated with and thereby lost in a large payment, the income tax, and thereby rendered relatively invisible. It was also a, re a reduction in the amount one otherwise would have had to pay which is an amorphous amount which you could see would be difficult to calculate. The savings match, on the other hand, was a benefit which was separated and thereby very salient and felt as if you were getting a gift that you would forego if you don't save. And our concern is that providing employee health incentives through premium adjustments is a lot like the savers credit here. You can see how you could provide fairly big incentives and they could be rendered relatively invisible. Typically, typically, people's premium payments come out of their bank accounts or their paychecks with direct deposit into their bank accounts. And a lot of that could happen relatively invisibly. It's not that it wouldn't have any effect, it's just that dollar for dollar, it's gonna be likely to be less effective than an approach in which the benefits are separated and thereby much more visible. So the takeaway here is that a dollar is not equal to a dollar. The design elements are really a key determinant of program success. 
In our Roybal Center on, on Translating Research into Practice that's funded by NIA, we've developed the following approach to think about how these decision errors that make people predictably rational can be used to make incentive programs more effective dollar for dollar. So we know that people focus much more on the present as opposed to the future. The clear implication here is that rewards for beneficial behavior need to be more frequent and immediate. Framing and segregating of rewards, as I just illustrated, is very important. So a $100 reward is likely to be more effective than a $100 discount on premium. Overweighting of small probabilities is another very common finding in the behavioral economics literature. We see evidence of this in other contexts because Americans spend about $50 billion a year of their own money on lotteries, even though the typical state lottery actually doesn't provide very good returns on average to people. And the implication here is that probabilistic rewards like lotteries can be used to really help motivate self-interested behavior. We also know people are very aversive to regret. This can be used to tell people whether they won and whether they would have won had they been adherent. And then we also know people are very loss averse and rewards can be put at risk if behavior doesn't change. We think that needs to be done carefully because it's hard to position yourself as an employer of choice that's doing all this to try to help your employees become healthier if they feel like they're getting penalized left and right. But used selectively, this can be very effective. And then there's the status quo bias, which underlies a lot of the effectiveness of defaults, where modifying the path of least resistance is really important. I'm going to give you a few examples of how we've used these approaches in practice. This was some work we did among employees at General Electric where we randomized employees to either information about smoking cessation programs or the same information plus a package of incentives worth $750. Eligibility in this case was tied to quitting within the first six months and at 12 months we had a quit, weight, quit rate ratio of about 2.9. 14.7 versus 5%. We then turned the incentive program off and still had a quit rate ratio of 2.6. Based on this, GE implemented a plan for all their employees in the U.S. in 2010. We've also done work directly comparing standard economic versus behavioral economic approaches. This was an example of an experiment we ran at a mid-sized employer this was an employer that was paying $25 to its employees to complete health risk assessments. And the, um, the issue here was they were concerned that the completion rates weren't as high as they would like. So they wanted to take the standard approach of increasing $25 to $50. We convinced them to run this as an experiment. So some of the work sites went from $25 to $50, some went from $25 to an expected value of 50 using a regret lottery. And the way this worked is that the workforce was divided into existing groupings of four to eight people. At random each week at each work site, one group was chosen. If you personally had completed your HRA, you'd get $100. If more than 80% of the people in your group had completed an HRA, you'd get 125. So it was designed to have exactly the same expected value and you can see that doubling the incentive value only led to a 10% increase in participation, but doubling the incentive value and adding behavioral economic approaches led to a 60% increase in participation. We've done a number of studies looking at this in the context of medication adherence. This is an example of some work we've been doing with warfarin. Warfarin is an anti-stroke medication that's used to prevent blood clots in people with irregular heartbeats or mechanical heart valves. It's also used to treat blood clots in the legs that can travel to the lungs. And what many health systems have found around the country is that adherence for this, as for many other chronic asymptomatic conditions, is much lower than clinically would be desirable. So what we did is we designed a daily lottery incentive where you had either a 1 in 5 or 2 in 5 chance of winning $10 a day or a 1 in a and a 1 in 100 chance of winning $100 a day if you took your warfarin the previous day. And you can see this was highly effective 
at reducing non-adherence rates in this population close to zero. We've done a number of studies in the context of weight loss. This was a study we did among veterans at the Philadelphia VA where we randomized people to either just getting weighed once a month or a daily lottery very similar to what I just described, the lower expected value of $3 a day, or what's called a deposit contract. A deposit contract provides people with the opportunity to put their own money at risk. This money uh, is foregone and given to other people who are successful at losing weight if they don't succeed in meeting weight loss goals. But if they do, do meet their weight loss goals, then we would double their money. And you can see that about 50% of people in the intervention arms succeeded in reaching the goal. The goal in this case was a pound of weight loss a week over 16 weeks compared to 10% in the control group. Another approach which we've been working on developing uh, relates to social incentives. We have a number of these studies in the field now, but this was an initial demonstration of a concept where we took people who used to have poor control of diabetes and now have good control and paired them with people who still have poor control and just encouraged them to try to help each other. And this was actually quite successful at improving glycemic control and A1C improvement of, of 1.08 is actually much bigger than many of the highly successful medications that are on the market to treat diabetes. And you can see in this case, it was also more effective than a financial incentive. So finally, I want to talk a bit about a concept called automated hovering. And we see this as, as being very important in terms of thinking about the underlying changes that are happening in provider payment. Uh, as many of you know, we have largely had a reactive fee-for-service visit-based model up till now and there's been a lot of changes underfoot to switch provider payment to focus more on population health in that providers will often now have a fixed payment per patient per year. And now the issues of non-adherence, obesity, smoking uh, are much more of, of a financial issue for healthcare providers because they're bearing financial risk for the healthcare costs of this population. So we see some type of hovering as being very central for the success of these models like accountable care organizations and medical homes. And the underlying challenge here is that the typical American, even one with multiple chronic diseases, doesn't actually spend much time each year in front of a doctor. If you think about the average visit length being seven, eight, nine minutes, then you can have a lot of visits and still spend only one to two hours a year with the doctor, meaning that you have 5,000 plus waking hours elsewhere. Generally speaking, physicians don't really know much about what their patients are doing during those other 5,000 hours, nor do they really have effective tools to alter their behavior in realms which have a big bearing on health outcomes such as medication adherence or obesity. And we think there's tremendous opportunity here to make a difference going forward by leveraging the proliferation of wireless devices and the advances in our understanding of behavioral economics to think about population health and really improving the management of chronic disease. The, one of the key points here is that a lot of elements, a lot of different approaches have been tried in this context in terms of areas like reducing readmission rates using personnel. But personnel are very expensive and personnel also won't have detailed data either on what people are doing day to day or moment to moment. So a substantial amount of hovering could be useful, but it needs to be done in a very cost effective way. We've gotten support from NIH to build a platform that really helps to, to facilitate this in a way which is fairly seamless. So the participant at home is given, depending on what sort of research program they're in, various types of devices. We are device agnostic. We basically choose these devices based on devices being easy to use and in essence 
uh, one of the key properties we feel is that having the data these devices generate being passively uploaded so that it's frictionless for the end user is very important. But the participants might have a wireless pill cap, a wireless scale, a pedometer, a device that measures blood sugar, blood pressure, CPAP use, a whole variety of different clinical applications. And these devices then automatically transmit information to our server. The server then calculates based on the type of research protocol people are in their behavior and then provide some feedback by text, by email, by IVR. Participants can choose how they want to be contacted and then transfers funds to them electronically. So it, this has created a lot of possibilities to do these types of interventions in different settings around the country. But one thing I want to highlight is that it's not all about technology. What we find, of course, here is that if we take patients who are selected because they have poorly controlled blood sugar, they have poorly controlled blood sugar because they're relatively non-adherent. And if they're relatively non-adherent to medications, chances are they'll also be relatively non-adherent to using daily glucometer and blood pressure monitoring. And that's what we found in this initial study. This blue line here on the left basically shows what happens in terms of daily adherence rates over time. After three months, people are only using these devices in the control group about 50% of the time. And what we were testing here was two different types of lottery incentives, and you can see that those were successful at getting people to use the devices to measure blood sugar and blood pressure at least daily about 80% of the time. This was also associated with what appear to be uh, much better rates of glycemic control. I do, want to I, I do want to highlight though that this was a pilot study. It was powered based on the differences in adherence. Those are highly significant. It was not powered based on differences in A1C. So those differences are suggestive, but, but they're not conclusive. So we now have a number of approaches like this that we're testing in settings around the country. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about a few of these, but there's a number of different disease areas we're working in, looking at smoking cessation, obesity in various employer settings, uh, different approaches that we think could really expand on the existing medical home 1.0 model by bringing in patient engagement as a key element to that. And then there's a number of studies we're doing on medication adherence, which are looking at some of these elements and approaches and trying to figure out how to do them in a scalable way using this technology. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about a couple of these examples. Uh, one is the first study to our knowledge to look at the question of if you are allocating a certain amount of resources to an incentive, are you best off allocating it to providers, to patients, or a combination of the two? And this is a study that's funded by the National Institute of Aging where we're randomizing patients who are known to have very high risk of cardiovascular disease or known coronary artery disease and who have LDL cholesterols that are higher than the recommended goals, no contraindications for study uh, for statins, and we randomized them to either patient incentives, provider incentives, or a combination of the two versus a control group. As part of this, we've tried to address some of the limitations to provider pay for performance from a behavioral economic standpoint. Uh, we're setting this up to reward either improvement or attainment of a single threshold as opposed to just attainment of a threshold. The issue here is, let's say you have an incentive program that's based on having patients achieve an LDL of less than 100. If I have some patients who have LDLs of 110 or 120, and I have other patients who have LDLs of 220, uh, the rational physician will focus on the LDL, the patients who have LDLs of 110 or 120, those are the ones in which the clinical benefit is going to be the smallest, but where the likelihood of achieving the incentive is going to be the greatest. And we think this is a, a fundamental problem with a lot of the provider pay for performance systems that are out there that just focus on a single threshold. We need to make sure that the higher risk patients are also the ones 
where uh, providers feel it makes sense to engage. And I think a lot of this probably happens subconsciously, but there's evidence from other contexts that people do work harder when they're closer to a goal, and we're trying to, in essence, incorporate multiple goals here so that both high-risk and low-risk patients are, are seen as, uh, as appropriate targets for the intervention. So another limitation to provider pay for performance is that, of course, it focuses only on providers and doesn't align the incentives for physicians and patients. We're also incorporating as part of this meaningful information to providers on what their patients are actually doing in terms of adherence. So every month, providers get a report on the percent of days that patients in the previous month had taken their medicine Typically now, providers really don't know this. When a patient comes to see me in the office, I do have the benefit of, of being able to look at their prescription fill rates, and that gives me some sense of whether they're at least filling their prescriptions. But in most clinical settings, people don't have that, and the provider sort of has to guess, did patients actually take their medicines? and that, that's a very imperfect way of trying to, to monitor adherence. There's also another issue, which is that there's often what are called, um, well, as I mentioned earlier, bundled payments. So the payments are tied into existing payment systems, and it obviously works much better to have these be separate payments because they're much more visible to people. Another new project is a project that's being funded by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. This is a project we're doing to try to tackle the problem of poor medication adherence for patients after hospitalization for a heart attack. And what we did as part of this was to try to develop a new model for innovation where the recognition was that the standard randomized trial design was going to produce very valid data but wasn't going to evolve very quickly to meet the urgency of some of the challenges we face. And this is a simple schemata of the approach we developed as part of this, where we randomize patients who have had a heart attack to either being in a control group or to being in an approach which is based on behavioral economics and which will, by design, evolve over time. And the key point here is that with this intervention as with any intervention anyone does, there's a lot of information that can and should develop over time. So even if you take the state of the art now and build that into version 1.0, there's a lot of side experiments that can be done that test each of those approaches, test each of the assumptions, and try to figure out how to either make them more effective or less costly. So for example, if a lottery incentive is part of this, there's a number of, of tests that can be done in parallel on the side that could be done to make that more effective and that could then be embedded in version 2.0. And so here's what model 1.0 looks like. We provide every patient a wireless pill bottle for all their cardiovascular medicines. They're given engagement incentives with daily lotteries which are conditional on medication adherence. We have a social incentive set up where each person is, in, is asked to, to include a friend or family member who they are enlisting as a support person. Once they miss two doses or more of a medication in a row, the friend or family member automatically gets a text, an email, or a interactive voice message. We also have clinical social workers who are assigned to each patient who, once the patient misses four doses or more of their medication, will then call the patient and the support person and try to help them. And the key here is that this approach doesn't obviate the need to have personnel, but you can obviously use personnel at a much lower ratio here because the technology and the underlying incentive structure can achieve much higher engagement rates on their own and then you can have the social worker only intervene on the people who are falling through the cracks. And we hope this will provide evidence on how to reduce readmissions and more efficiently manage chronic disease among high-risk patients. We've partnered with three insurers, uh, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, Independence Blue Cross, and Aetna to do this. We're gonna be doing this in a number of states in the Northeast and recently started enrolling patients. 
So there's a number of promising future directions here. We're seeing a lot of interest from employers, insurers, pharmacy benefits managers, and consumer product companies in terms of using behavioral insights to improve program effectiveness. We think the data is pretty clear that behavioral economics can help improve the efficiency of resources that are already being spent on incentives. The shifts that are happening in terms of healthcare delivery towards population-based financing will also help bring about significant opportunities for improvement in both the quality and cost of chronic care management using technology and social science engagement strategy. So in terms of thinking about actions to take, we think there's a few key actions to think about. One is to use default systematically. In many environments, we see that the standard default is basically an opt-in approach and participation rates are often very low. So thinking systematically about how you can use defaults, where you can use defaults, what type of defaults you can use. If you can't use an opt-out default, can you use an approach like enhanced active choice? Lots of opportunity there. Another big area is to think about how you can leverage insights from behavioral economics to make the dollars spent on incentives for healthy behavior more effective. You can modify your benefit design to align towards the desired behavior change. We do think simplification is an important element of that because the existing incentives that are embedded in plans are generally far too complicated. Uh, but if you have a simple plan, then you can think about focusing incentives to really drive uh, member engagement in terms of utilization of services in the direction you want them to go. And then finally, we think a big area for the future are these types of automated hovering approaches this is going to be really important in terms of thinking about both population health management and improve, improving the impact of the provider payment reform initiatives that are underway. So I'm going to stop there and I believe there's a, the mechanism for sending questions is to email Wendy Nielsen uh, at NIH or through Twitter and we'll try to take as many questions as we have in the next 15 minutes. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, we are monitoring for questions now. Um, maybe I could start with the first question. I'll take that. Your, um, your study that you're doing with, the, um, with your medication adherence in um, for heart attacks, after heart attacks. You had said after four episodes of non-adherence, how did you come up with four? And because uh, I think people are really struggling with these yeah. questions in adherence. Right, well, it's a great question. And basically what we did is we looked at data. So we have a lot of data on daily adherence from this study we're doing of provider versus patient incentives. We're now fully enrolled. We have 1,492 patients uh, in the Penn Health System, at Geisinger, and at Harvard Vanguard. And we looked at the patterns of what is the likelihood that you will miss tomorrow's dose based on missing today's dose. And we found if you miss one day, the likelihood you'll take tomorrow's dose is actually pretty high. It's still about 80%. If you miss two doses, it drops. It's probably about 65%. If you miss three days and then four days, it really starts to drop off. And so the balance here was that we thought that, you know, so you can imagine you could jump on this right away. So you miss one dose, we're going to pull out all the stops. On, and what we wanted to do was have a bit of a staged approach. So you miss one day, okay, the probability is overwhelming, you're actually going to take the medicine the next day. So we don't want to nag people too much. There are these underlying engagement incentives as it is every day and people will know that if you didn't win the lottery, you could have won the lottery, they're going to find that out. But so at two days we thought that's an appropriate time to let your social support person know uh, that that doesn't cost any money. It provides them an opportunity to get engaged, try to be helpful. And then we wanted to give that a couple days to work uh, before we get the clinical social worker involved. And this is something which is evolving. We'll see how that goes in version 1.0 of the model. If we find that corrective action is taken at a high percentage of the time by 
doing that alert at two days with the friend and family member, then maybe we'll leave the social worker alert at four days if we find that most people are not becoming adherent, who weren't adherent, to, not adherent at two days with our model, then we may move that up. So that's, that's something which is designed to evolve over time. <coughs> Great. Okay. So a uh, question about the social support interventions and some of the underlying behavioral economics principles. The social support there's a lot of different directions here to go in, and I've talked a little bit about the work we're doing on peer mentoring. We have another NIH trial which is underway now, which is also fully enrolled in people who have diabetes, where we're testing, in essence, a peer mentoring model versus an incentives model that does provide daily feedback. The example I'd given earlier I, I might have noted did not provide daily feedback, it only provided feedback if people improved their A1C over a six month period and we think that's one of the reasons that incentive wasn't as effective as it could have been. But in this new study we're testing a daily financial incentive feedback, uh, a peer mentoring system or the two combined and there's an open question here as to whether peer mentoring would be more effective or less effective with a financial incentive embedded we don't want to displace social altruism. On the other hand, one could imagine that you might have more engaged peer mentors because these are strangers who are volunteering to help each other. The approaches in terms of social incentives that we're looking at that involve friends or family, of course, are inherently very different because there we're taking an existing social network and trying to leverage that to try to help people to help each other. And part of the idea here is that there's a lot of people who might be perfectly willing to, let's say, help their, uh, you have an adult child and an elderly parent. And the elderly parent might be a bit forgetful, you'd like to help them take their medicines. But if you call them every day and say, did you take your medicines yet? That might be kind of annoying to both the elderly parent and the adult child after a while. And what we're trying to do here is basically test alternative ways of using the technology to provide alerts to people to know when to intervene. So now I only get alerted, for example, if, I, if my parent misses two doses. We have some other work we're doing uh, that is funded by CMMI where we're testing different models of feedback to the family member or friend where, for example, we alert them every day uh, or we just give them weekly reports and or we have different models of how many friends there are and how, there's, how their communication works. So there's a lot of open questions here about how to do this optimally. I think the technology creates possibilities which are interesting, but we have to empirically test how to do this in the most effective way possible. So <clears throat> we have a question from email um, saying, you know, many of what you're talking, many of the studies you're talking about are U.S. focused and high tech. Using tech. What about the possibility for chronic conditions in low-income countries, like HIV in Africa? Do you see a potential for these approaches? Yes, I do. Our, our focus, as per the guidance of our Center Advisory Board, has been on the U.S. by design. The thinking, of course, is that there are a lot of health problems in the U.S. There's a big disconnect between how much we spend and the health of our population, and we're a relatively small group of people. Um, but that said, we are very close to reaching agreement with a health insurer in South Africa uh, to work with them over the next five years on a series of approaches around improving health and well-being. And, and some of that work will be in South Africa, some of it will be in the U.S., um, some of it might be in other developing countries. So I think there's enormous potential and a lot of this is you know, I, I think the potential, particularly with HIV, is particularly exciting. A lot of the test and treat models rely very heavily on two assumptions. One is identifying people who have HIV. The other is, is actually getting people to take these highly effective medicines all the time. And unless those problems are solved, the mathematical models which predict uh, reducing the infectiousness of people, uh, of course, can't be realized. So another question relates to outside of a trial, 
how does the cost of the device and support compare to personnel cost? And I think this is an important question, and this is also, I think, very much a, a focus of where the research needs to be. With the study we're doing now that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is sponsoring, that's very much a explicit part of the picture. Uh, in essence, to get those studies funded, what the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation did is they asked all potential grantees to come up with estimates of how much the intervention would cost and how much how that would compare to the potential savings in health through, for example, reduced readmission rates. And so the models here, I think, are evolving. The models that historically have been used, as I mentioned, have relied very heavily on personnel. Uh, models like that can be very effective, but they do tend to be expensive. And what I think a lot of us are trying to figure out is what's the right balance here between technology and personnel and how do you optimize that is, is very much of a, an open question for research. So we have another question is, what's the difference between hovering and monitoring? Well, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I actually like the term hovering, which is uh, another discussion that we could have. So we're, we're, we're thinking about that. But, you know, I think in some sense, the idea, the, the key, well, there's, there's a few key issues here. One is actually having access to data on what people are doing day to day outside of the four walls of any provider office. Uh, a second big question, of course, is what do you do with that information? And there's, a real sensitivity here, which I think is important to doing this monitoring or hovering in a way which isn't intrusive to the end user. So it's very hard. A lot of the apps that are out there, they require people to do things that deviate from, from their regular routines. And a very high percentage of apps, people stop using them after a few weeks because it might get tiresome, for example, to photograph your food every meal, to record your calorie count. And what we're trying to do is really focus on the types of approaches which people can do relatively seamlessly. So for example, once they put their medication into a wireless pill bottle, uh, then that, of course, can be done with no more incremental effort than it would take to take your medicine regularly or if instead of using a regular glucometer that's not wireless, now you use a wireless glucometer, then obviously that can also be done uh, in a way which is probably much more likely to be sustainable. And the sustainability here is really the key issue because there's a lot of things that you can get people to do for a few weeks, but that's not gonna have any impact on management of their chronic diseases, so it's really about trying to figure out how do you create solutions that are both sustainable and scalable, which of course inherently means they have to be cost effective. Okay, and now and our final question is, what about you talking mostly about adults, children and adolescents? <clears throat> well, this is a great question and a really important question because when you look at areas like obesity, uh, clearly it doesn't really make sense to wait until people are adults to try to intervene. A few months ago, the pediatric obesity program at our children's hospital in Philadelphia reached out to us to see if we could work with them on using our platform to try to tackle pediatric obesity. So we have a project that's uh, in a pretty advanced stage of planning with them, which looks like it's gonna go forward, where we're gonna be testing some of these approaches in the context of pediatric obesity. I think that a lot of these approaches could be used, but there's a different set of challenges, whether you're talking about adolescents or small children. Uh, we had debated with them, you know, which should we work on first with small children? It's obviously an intervention that involves both the child and their parents. With adolescents, one could argue the intervention primarily focuses on the adolescents. It might or might not involve the parents to a lesser or greater degree, but there, there's obviously very different issues here. So I think the key is to think very carefully 
about these programs and how they're designed and to do them with input from clinicians who are very comfortable with and familiar with the issues that affect either small children or adolescents. That's not a space that we have expertise in, but partnering with the group that does, I, th I think these approaches could be quite useful. Great. So I know, uh, I know you all gained as much from this as I did. Um, I really want to, from NIH and the Adherence Network, thank Dr. Volt for doing this with us. It was just been an amazing and interesting hour. We will be posting the video online. It'll be archived. I'll send out a message when that is. So thank you so much, and we look forward to you joining us on June 12th, which will be our next webinar, and that will be with Heidi Crane from the University of Washington talking about her work in measurement of self-reported adherence. So thank you, and have a wonderful day.